Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Wonder Goal, the soccer betting podcast from the Action Network presented to you by Bet365. My name is Michael Leboff and joining me for this hour, first uh, group stage preview for the Euros. So we'll go through the first match uh, of the group stages, each team. I think what comes out to 12 matches, uh, match by match, give out our favorite bets. Um, joining me for it are BJ Cunningham and Sam Ingram. Uh, and that means we got to start with the opener, which is Friday. June 14th, 3 p.m. Eastern time, 8 p.m. Uh, British summertime, which is where uh, Sam is. Uh, it's Germany and Scotland. Germany, the host, as you can imagine, are prohibitive favorites. They're minus 350 on the three-way line. Scotland coming back at 8-1. to one, And the draw here is 5-1. to one. Sam, uh, we're going to start with you because you are looking to perhaps find a way in on the underdogs here. Hello, Michael. Yes, I am. Um, I'll, I'll touch on it in the other game in the group as well. Um, but usually, opening games of the tournaments are quite tricky to navigate, especially if you're a tournament host. Um, all of these teams, all these nations, all of these supporters in your own backyard, something which has been planned and built up to for a number of years. Lots of pressure. Um, and in the first game, when you're heavy minus three, five, seven favourites as well, and you simply have to go out there and put on a show, that can't be nice. I've not played a game at a major tournament, unfortunately, but uh, I'm sure there's going to be a few nervous faces in both dressing rooms. And obviously, Scotland aren't at Germany's level, should lose this game, but will they lose by the two goals required to make the current Asian handicap line a loser? And um, you can get Scotland on a plus 1.5 Asian handicap at plus 102. Um, I'm, not, I'm not too sure. Uh, if you think that these two teams arrive and like f- try and feel themselves into the tournament, turn up, make themselves hard to beat over everything else, then there might not be a two-goal advantage to either side on Friday night. And I've looked into the opening fixtures at the European Championships all the way back to 1980. So I've been working hard, and only once has there been an opening day win with a two-goal margin. And that came in the previous Euros when Italy uh, trounced the not so dark horses, Turkey, who got absolutely nowhere near a gallop in a tournament that they performed miserably in. Before that, um, I won't go through them all, but France 2 1, Romania, Poland 1 1 against Greece, Swiss lost 1 0 against Czech Republic in 2008, Greece beat Portugal 2 1 on their frantic run to silverware in 2004. Um, and if you go all the way back to 96, England drew 1 1 against the Swiss. So there aren't usually runaway statement winners in the opening game of this tournament um, and usually with most of the countries in the United Kingdom Scotland will give absolutely everything in every single minute of each game there is if, if they've got anything it's fight and desire in that Scotland side and they'll die for that badge so that might be enough along with it being the opening game of the tournament um, to avoid a two-go margin loss in, in a tense night in, in Munich so yeah um, it's it's quite a tentative lean but scotland plus 1.5 that there are definitely worse bets yeah that actually uh blends really nicely into what i'm gonna suggest here a bet i really like i I like the first half to end scoreless zero zero because like you said i think scotland's gonna show up here and just try to make themselves robust and tough to beat hard to break down and i think it takes a little while for a team like germany uh, as you said with all that pressure on their shoulders as the host and one of the tournament favorites and a huge favorite in this match to find their way um into into this game i think that creates a a pretty good atmosphere for like a stodgy pretty uh rock fighty uh first 45 minutes the the odds tell you it's very likely germany ends up getting ahead here and and getting the win uh but i do think it takes a little bit of time for them to get there so i i think that the first half to go under um half a goal so zero zero a correct score first half depending on on your sports book, how they list it, uh, plus 240, I think, is a, is a good bet here. So that's where I'm going, BJ. I think that this thing starts off, the whole tournament starts off pretty nervy. Uh, from there, who knows where it goes. But um, I like the price there on the 0 0 first half. Yeah, I don't hate that at all. Um, so here, the, the thing with Scotland is I think this game is incredibly game state dependent, as all, you know, a lot of international matches, especially these tournaments, are because. Well, obviously, we're not playing a 38 match season. We're only playing three games. So the second teams fall behind. They tend to get a lot more desperate than they would over a normal cl- over a normal club season. But Scotland, over their two meetings with Spain in qualifying, actually did a really really good good job defensively in their defensive block. And what they did, especially in the first meeting that they won two nothing, 
They were obviously playing up a goal for for majority of the match, but they closed off the central parts of the pitch. Spain wasn't able to play through there, and eventually Spain just said, okay, we have to get the ball wide and we have to settle for crosses. Germany is a team that similarly wants to dominate the middle of the pitch. They want to try to create overloads there, and Scotland's not going to allow them to do that. And Germany is not really set up. If you look at the profile of their team and their strikers and everything, they're not typically a team that's set up to just swing in 20 crosses and try to score goals off of that. You know, Havertz is a good aerial threat, but outside of him, they're really a team that needs to build up through the middle. So if Scotland's not going to allow them to do that, which I think is a great shout, Sam, that it's going to be hard for Germany. But the the flip side of it also is for Scotland, the second that goal goes in for Germany, if it does, that might be a little bit worrisome if Scotland has to be the one that comes out and presses them and try to force the issue. So um, I think it's just kind of really dependent on, you know, the longer this thing goes zero, zero, the better chance Scotland has of nicking a goal and McTominay can hopefully maybe hit one from outside the box. But, you know, again, for me, it's, it's the first game of the tournament. Like I really want to have a bet on it, but Michael, I went back and looked at my last two uh, bets from the last two international tournaments uh, Euro 2021, uh, I was on Turkey plus one yep. and a half. They got absolutely smoked. Um, and then I bought into the Qatar conspiracy uh, for yep. the World Cup. And uh, they were down two nothing inside, what, 10 minutes? So yeah. I think I'm going to sit this one out. We I don't get think better I as these international these tournaments get on, tournament, get so. on right? Yeah. yeah so we just get... I don't think I, uh, I, I want to dip my toe in. So, yeah, I'm going to pass. Uh, all right, so that's that's the opener. That's the standalone game on Friday afternoon here um, in the evening over across the Atlantic. Uh, and then things really start to get going with three matches a day starting on Saturday morning, June 15th, 9 a.m. Eastern time, 2 p.m. Uh, over in England. It's Hungary and it's Switzerland. And it is the Swiss as a plus 125 favorite on the three-way line. Hungary coming back plus 230. And the draw here is plus 230 as well. This is a... A pretty trendy, uh, pretty trendy sleeper, uh, dark horse. I wouldn't say that a lot of people are backing Hungary to to go on a run, but people are circling the wagon a little bit around this team, BJ. But uh, you you were pretty stout in your stance that you you were against that notion, uh, and you're gonna kind of obviously lean lean in here, and I'm I'm along for the ride here on the Swiss. Yeah. I uh I really like Switzerland plus one fifteen in this first matchup. Uh, so Switzerland during qualifying, other than Portugal and France, had the best expected goal differential per ninety minutes at two, which is outstanding. And what's crazy is they actually pretty drastically underformed defensively. They allowed eleven goals off of five point five expected, uh, which you don't typically see from a team that has two outstanding goalkeepers. You know, in Jan Sommer and Gregor Cabal. Um, but they are very well prepared to face this Hungary team because. In the two matches against Romania, where they created over a combined five expected goals, they were constantly dominating the half spaces with quick one-touch passing, getting triangles there, forcing a back line of five to come out and defend them. And the second they did, they played right through them and created a bunch of chances off of that. Hungary is going to sit in a 5-3-2. They're going to play very, very passive. And I think Switzerland, given the teams that they face in their group, are really well set up to do that because, you know, like I mentioned in our preview pod, it is an old Swiss team. Like it's a team that it's just copy and paste the roster from 2021 to the 2022 world cup to now, but this team has been playing together with Marat Yakin for a really long time. And they know the system very, very well. The problem with Hungary is that they're going to rely on a few counterattacking opportunities, mainly via crosses, which if you want a way that they can win this match or, you know, it's probably going to be against via crosses because the Swiss do struggle with those, but they're not very good at counterpressing. So if they decide to do that, like they did against Serbia, Serbia was able to play right through them. Um, I generally think the Swiss are really set up here to play in transition when they have the ball. And for Hungary, it's only Solbaslai in, in buildup for them. If they cannot get him the ball, everything tends to fall apart. So if Swiss decide to double him, or if they decide to put Shaka, or one of the best defenders on him and just take him away, um, that is going to make things very, very difficult for Hungary to create chances. So um, I have the Swiss projected at minus 141, or, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to say out these percentages for projections. Cause hopefully now that we have Sam on here, we brought a couple people from England uh, to listen to this podcast, but that's around 58%. So at plus 115, that's around 47%. So I have a pretty decent edge here on this first game. So I like the Swiss at plus 115. Sam, you're 
you're not going to be jumping on the Swiss here, but uh, something else a, a little bit further down the board, looking at a prop here. Yeah, it's it's quite similar to your first bet that you mentioned of the of the under uh, one goals in in the opener. Uh, it's not really a market I usually like or take. I, I personally find it quite difficult to like break down regular season games into two halves in my mind from like a betting perspective. When we're say, I don't know, 15 games into a season, for example, I think that's difficult to do unless there are clear trends and patterns to a side style of play or maybe a manager's approach against, you know, bigger teams, smaller teams, whatever it may be. But at a major tournament in the opening game between two nations who I think are, are quite evenly matched um, and in a game where the two sides are likely playing for second and third in the group, for me, Similarly to the Germany game, that screams of a, a quite a tentative start from both teams. In theory, Hungary, Hungary and Switzerland should begin the match feeling each other out. There should be a period of sparring, sizing the opposition up. It's tough for, it's tough for us betters coming into a major tournament and, and using previous friendlies and qualifying campaigns to measure how Team A will get on against Team B. And it's, it's difficult for these teams and managers too. So naturally, unless there's a big goal in between nations, the two sets of players and management teams will be wary at the very least and somewhat concerned about just how good the other is with so much at stake and so much on the line. So with that thought process, I've asked myself, how do we get that thinking into a selection at maybe an odds against price and the most goals scored in the second half option at Bet365 at plus 110 um, gets that for us. And it ticks a few boxes if you think similarly to me. If there's a goal in the first half, that opens up the second half massive, massively, a little like what BJ was saying in the opening game. The next goal would be super important. And then we could see somewhat of a shootout as one side pushes for the next. If there are no goals in the first half, then you can be sure either manager will get their team in at halftime and pinpoint exactly where he thinks his side can capitalise in the second half. And I, I don't have any stats or numbers for you in terms of how many times this has happened in qualifying in recent friendlies. I'm not interested in that. This is all about current situation and game state. We've said it a couple of times already. You might fancy Hungary, you may fancy Switzerland, but for me, it's quite close on paper and I'd rather take second half goals, I think, over maybe Switzerland on the nose at a similar price or Hungary at a bigger price. Okay. Uh, so that's that's Group A, the second match of Group A, along with Germany and Scotland. Let's move on and we'll talk uh, Group of Death stuff. Spain and Croatia at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Spain is odds on minus 112 to win this on the three-way line. Croatia plus 350. Uh, and the draw here is plus 240. Sam, you and I are on the same side here. I'm kind of debating. I I don't want to turn a, a winner into a loser, but I do. Th so the more and more I think about this matchup and what Spain wants to do, I don't think Croatia is going to have the ball enough to really make an impact on, on this game. I could see this being one-way traffic. Um, and Croatia obviously get a ton of respect in the market because they are Croatia. They're a really tough tournament team. They've proven that and they are good. They're technically sound and their, their experience, all that stuff. But I do think that if this thing goes pear shaped for Croatia, it could get ugly and I want to beat the market to that. So I'm trying to figure out if I just want to, you know, lay the minus one, one tennis price out there on Spain just to win it. Or if I want to go look at Spain to win to nil Spain on an alternate spread. Uh, but I think there's every reason to believe in, in Spain getting off the mark here. Yeah, I would agree with that. I'm, I'm also a little concerned. I picked this out before they played Portugal the other the other night. So when I saw Croatia did a number on them, yeah, this, I, I don't know, it, it cast a few doubts, but it is a friendly, so right. I don't know. I don't know how much to, to buy into that. But um, yeah, since since winning Euro 2012, Spain have won just seven matches at major international tournaments. So yeah, that that's maybe got me questioning myself too. So probably daftly, I'm, I'm going to go for Spain to win the opener at minus 111. So I see that as quite an attractive price as fifth favourite stake on a Croatia side, ninth in the betting at 40-1 to, to win the tournament. Um, I don't like Spain to cause the biggest of splashes this summer, but I do fancy them in this group. And they've, if you look at their um, possible lineup um, on on the weekend, they've got a decent midfield, one of the best in the world in Rodri. Next to him, likely Pedri and, and Fabio and Ruiz too. So moving forward, Dani Olmo, Lamine Yamal, who's threatening a breakout tournament and 
got Nico Williams, whose production and then product over the season has ushered him into the conversation for a start. And we spoke about Morata and his deputy, Hosselu, on the Futures pod too. So there's enough there to get me semi-excited about Spain. Um but that, but but maybe not to get past one of the heavy hitters, and that's one thing I don't think Croatia will be. I'm not sold on their age in midfield. I think you may have said that too, Michael, in the futures pod. Modric, it's like a fine wine, but he's old, 37 now, and you know, in, in football terms, um, you got another one sending himself in in Saudi Arabia. So I'm not too sure about their midfield, especially up against the Spanish midfield. They've they've done brilliantly, Croatia, for a number of years punching above their weight in, t- in terms of country size and population. Um, I could be wildly wrong because they did just go and beat um, Portugal. But I also saw BJ tweet about him finding great enjoyment watching everyone overreact at pre-tournament friendlies. And if I was on my phone over the weekend, there'd have been a few tweets about the England game too. So, um, <laughs> I was going to say, there's, not rea- there's no overreaction in England. Uh, yeah, no, they're good. <laughs> yeah, they, well, yeah, a little bit. It always is. But I'm glad I didn't send a tweet out. I'm glad I was busy because BJ may give me some stick. But um, I don't think, I think you, maybe you should bear it in mind, but that there shouldn't be a mirroring performance in uh, terms of result or in the opener for Croatia. I think this is a different kettle of fish. And at close to even money, I don't mind taking Spain on here. Yeah, I mean, Sam, I... You... <laughs> You saw what happened over the weekend to our great nation losing 5-1 to Colombia. So generally with these friendlies, um, I don't take much from them because uh, the intensity level is not there at the end of the day. It's just practice. You know, if England was playing Iceland in the group stage, I think you were going to see a lot more intensity and actually have them pushing harder to score the goal. And I think they eventually probably would have. Um, but in general, you know, take these friendlies for what they are as friendlies. In terms of this game, I do like under two and a half goals at minus 135. Uh, so Spain, Luis de la Fuente is now in. Not much is going to change from Luis Enrique because de la Fuente has been managing through the Spanish youth ranks for over a decade now. So it's the exact same system as Luis Enrique. In qualifying, they did not hold, in a single match, they did not hold under 67% possession. They are the most possession dominant team in this entire field. But what we've seen from Spain is that possession can get stale. The ball circulation can get slow. And when they become a little too obsessed with playing through the middle, that's when the the problems generally come in. In that first match against Scotland, they kept trying to play through the middle. They only had only ended up creating 1.3 expected goals and only had nine shots. And they're facing a Croatia team that, yes, we are all very, very down on them. I'm, I mean, we're all very down on their offense, right? The defense is still a very difficult team to play through. Like the midfield is still there from a defensive standpoint. They still have a solid center back pairing. They only allowed 0.58 expected goals per 90 minutes in qualifying. So I think of all the matches in this first round, this is going to be the slowest and the, the one with the fewest counterattacks because although, you know, Spain has a, a, pretty glaring weakness is that teams that can play quick balls over the top or get at them because they're generally going to be because they push so many guys forward they're generally going to be in a lot of 3v3 or 2v2 situations in transition uh Croatia just doesn't have the speed and they just don't have the forwards that are really good in transition so um I only projected 1.9 goals for this first game um so I like under two and a half a minus 135 okay in the Saturday uh Finale is Italy and Albania. This is 3 p.m. Eastern time, 8 p.m. Eastern, or excuse me, 8 p.m. British summertime. Uh, Spain, excuse me, Italy is a minus 250 favorite. Albania coming back at 7 1 to draw here, plus 375. I don't really have much here, but I do think I this one sneakily feels like a draw. Like, I think this is actually a decent bet on a draw or even a nil nil if you want to chase a bigger price, BJ, because I it feels you know, you don't want to make direct correlations, but it kind of would remind me of uh, Italy, New Zealand in 2010 World Cup, where it's just one team trying to sit back and keep this thing as respectable as possible because that third place uh, position for Albania is is the path to advancing, right? So they got to keep their goal difference intact. And with that in mind, I think Italy is a team that they can at least quiet down, right? Like, I don't think Italy is going to run rampant over them. Um and maybe that sets up for a nil nil or a one one. So I think plus three seventy five is okay on a draw. I think that's what I'll end up being on, if anything, 
Um, but you guys are on the same side, BJ, so you can get the conversation started. Yeah, um, I like under two and a half goals at minus 110. Um, so Albania, um, they are, I would put them in the same group as a team like uh, Georgia, who is going to play one of the more extreme low blocks uh, in this tournament field. You know, a lot of teams will sit in defensive blocks, but you'll see even teams like Slovakia and Romania will play mid to high blocks and they will actually try to apply a little bit of ball pressure. But Albania will just let you walk the ball into the final third. But once you get there, they are very active and they do man mark and they do put pressure on the ball. So there's not a lot of easy passes that actually go into the penalty area. I mean, during qualifying, they only allowed four goals and they allowed under one expected goal per 90 minutes. So generally, even though there isn't a lot of talent in this Albanian side, they have a pretty good defensive structure that can keep Italy out here. And Italy, even though Italy's offense has been improving under Spalletti, you know, 12 expected goals in the, in the six matches that he was in charge, a lot of those came from positive game states when they were leading and they decided to just continually run up the score. Um, you know, I, I don't think Albania is going to have much of a, a an attack here. I mean, they averaged under one expect goal for 90 minutes in qualifying. And a lot of their chances were just transition breaks and they just hit bangers from outside the box. Like it just kept happening, kept happening over and over again. Now, to be fair to Albania, you know, they didn't have Armando Broja available during qualifying. But as is the case, even though a striker can be really good, if he's left on an island, he's not going to have much service and he's not going to have many opportunities to create a big scoring chance. And Italy's a very good defense, especially defending in transition and ball stopping in the middle of the pitch. So um, only projected a little over two goals for this match. So I like under two and a half and minus 110. Yeah, I'm, I'm exactly the same, BJ. For, for Italy, they enter this tournament unfavoured and very much an outsider in that rung of nations that usually compete at the business end. European champions too, but you're not going to mention them, uh, hear them mentioned in like the plethora of, of betting previews making the rounds at the minute. They're in a difficult group. Spain will like their chances of beating Italy. Croatia will too. That makes the Italy versus Albania tie, of which their minus 250 favourites, a big one for Luciano Spalletti, uh, Italy's new manager. So he faces, for me, quite an uphill battle in terms of getting his nation set up at a major tournament and playing exactly how he would like to. He's not had long there. He's got no international or, uh, sorry, he's got no international major tournament experience. He's got a Serbia out of the back, Scalvini's out of the back. The starting back four won't be Italy's best. And I'm not too convinced how Spalletti is going to go up top. I would start Skamaka. I think many people would after a season uh, he's had for Atlanta. But he's only got 16 international cuts for his country. And that's spread out since 2021. He scored just one goal. Um, and he started just one game in six appearances in the qualifiers. So you look through this Italy side and I'm not sure there are many you can say like a world-class match winners that are going to and make something from nothing. Maybe Federico Chiesa at his absolute best fits into that bracket, and they'll need him at full foot or up top with Skamaka to, to get far at the Euros. Um, but just, just think, like, Italy might struggle to edge in front here for large periods, and Albania will obviously be more than happy with a draw. So that difference set up uh, in itself might lead this selection home, especially... Like if you're not sold on Italy and forward areas accompanying like an Albanian front line or Albanian forward areas, which who currently stands as favourites to be the lowest scoring nation at Euro 2024. Um, and although they won their Euro qualifying group, Group E, they did so by scoring 12 goals, which was less than every other nation who finished first and second in there in the other nine qualification groups. So yeah, they're, they're not blessed in forward areas. Brozier was out of qualifying, like BJ said, but I just, well, it's I suppose it's natural to believe they'll probably struggle here. And like I said, yeah, if you're not sold up top on on Italy's chances, then maybe you should probably lean to to an unders play. So under two point five minus one ten, yeah, that's I, I don't mind that. All right, that's uh, Saturday done and dusted. We'll keep going through match by match. We'll also do our our three leg underdog parlay uh, and then give out our favorite bet for the first uh, leg of group stage matches but before we get to all that a reminder wonder goal is presented by bet365 and bet365 doesn't do ordinary that's why you get more boost with them than anyone else every day they power up the odds on hundreds of bets to give you a chance to win more bet365 boosts specific markets your winnings and even parlays and they don't stop there 
keep an eye out for their biggest and best super boost. It's keep an eye out for their biggest and best odds with the incredible super boost. Check out the boost and see why it's never ordinary at bet three, six, five. You must be 21 or older and present in Arizona, Colorado, Indiana, Iowa, Louisiana, New Jersey, North Carolina, Ohio, Virginia, or 18 and older in Kentucky. And if you or anyone you know has a gambling problem and wants help, please call 1-800-GAMBLER or 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. Okay, Sunday morning, 9 a.m. Eastern time, 2 p.m. in England. We got Poland and the Netherlands. Uh, the Poles are plus 400. Underdogs, Netherlands minus 154. The draw is three to one on the three-way line. I got nothing here. I, I am rooting for the Netherlands. I have a future on them uh, to win the whole tournament. Uh, but BJ, you think that this could be a little trickier uh, than maybe these odds imply. Yeah, and I'll just preface this by saying I could be absolutely dead wrong. Um, but I think Poland is getting a little undervalued in this tournament. So if we just go off of, you know, even Poland at the World Cup, I mean, they got throttled by Argentina. But outside of that match, they really weren't that bad. They outplayed both Mexico and Saudi Arabia to get to the round of 16. And if you remember that round of 16 match, they actually weren't that bad against France. And they actually ended up winning the expected goals battle despite losing. And, you know, Poland finished third in their qualifying group and they had to go via the playoff. They beat Wales in penalties. But if if you go back to what happened during qualifying, they hired Fernando Santos, former Portugal manager, at the beginning of qualifying. And it was an absolute complete disaster. And they had to fire him halfway through. They promoted their U21 coach, Michael Proberis, to the, the, the head, man, head spot. And the performances just instantly got better. In five qualifying matches in charge, he had a plus 6.3 expected goal differential, and they only allowed 3.4 expected goals. Uh, Poland will sit in a 5-3-2. You know, it, nothing's really changed from the last World Cup, but they're incredibly active in it, and they're actually pretty good. During Euro qualifying, they allowed the lowest cross cross completion rate, the lowest forward pass completion rate, and were even third in pass per defensive action. So they didn't, don't just sit deep. They will sit in a mid-block, and they will give teams a lot of problems. The Netherlands, the concerns I have about them, not really across the back line. I, I think you can make an argument that the Netherlands, as a, as a group, is one of the best back lines in this entire tournament. But in terms of buildup, they drop way too many guys deep. It's sometimes seven, eight guys trying to build through the first two or three lines of pressure or first uh, or second lines of pressure. And then what happens with that is you're just leaving somebody like Wout Wegborst or Memphis Depay on an island up top, which I don't think at this stage they're really capable of uh, breaking a game. So I think this has the potential um, for being a very slow type of match, a very difficult one for the Netherlands to break through. So I generally think that the Dutch are just a tad overvalued here. Um, so I like Poland plus one in the Asian market at minus 135. Um, I only projected the Dutch at minus 115 or around 53, 54%. So I'm going to take a shot on Poland. Um, again, this could just, you know, this is one of those cases where Poland falls behind. This could get uh, really bad really fast, um, but just think the market's a little too high on the Netherlands. And Sam, you found a way to to target Netherlands in in what you think could be a uh, a good, I guess, a good way to get in on the favorite. Yeah, um, I don't disagree with BJ. I do think the the Netherlands are, are, are too small. I wouldn't take them on the nose to win the game. Definitely not. And if you've not listened to the Futures podcast that has come out early this week, then go and do that. In that podcast, I've put up the Poland is lowest scoring nation at plus 800. And they're a side who stuttered through the World Cup and they they needed playoffs to qualify for Germany, as BJ said. I, I don't know if it's a selection that's going to get over the line. I don't think they're going to take the unwanted crown, but I think it's, it's a good enough price to get behind. And if you think that Poland are probably going to struggle in front of goal and siding with unders in their group stage matches might be a way to enhance your prices, um, like in a parlay, for example. Like BJ said, one of the strongest defences in the competition, Ake van Dijk, van der Ven, De Ligt, De, De Vridge, Botman's at home injured, he would have been involved too. It's unbelievable, really, in terms of a backline. And if they can formulate some kind of a plan and performance level between them that locks down and isolates Robert Lewandowski, that and then, then they'll be left frustrated because there's defensive nouts in abundance in that Dutch team. 
do that, cut off Poland's main goal scoring threat. And I think Netherlands should win the game at minus 154. Not really interested in that. But yeah, coupling under five goals with a Netherlands win on the bet builder parlay function on Bet365, that gets us to near even money. Um, which which could be a shout if you're rummaging around the markets trying to find something pro-Dutch to get behind for the opener. If you look at, um, since the start of the World Cup, as a recent sample size, the last 16 games, which has had an average of 2.5 goals scored overall per 90 in matches involving Poland, they've only surpassed the over five goal line once. That was 5-1 win over Estonia and a 3-2 win away in Moldova. Two nations and a I don't want to upset our Moldovan listeners, but two nations who would struggle to lace the Netherlands' boots. So will the Dutch run away with proceedings? I'm not so sure. I don't think they will, but I certainly doubt that Poland's set up to encourage an end-to-end type of high-scoring encounter if they can help it. I think it'll be a low-scoring game, but I think the Dutch have just about enough to edge it. So the Netherlands and, and under five goals at minus 105. Speaking of rummaging around the market, I think that this next match, the 12 p.m. kickoff on Sunday between Slovenia and Denmark, which sees Slovenia as a plus 425 underdog. Denmark is odds on minus 138 and the draw plus 250. You'd really have to rummage to find something interesting here. I find this to be, in terms of betting, from a betting perspective, the least interesting of all the group stage matches. So I'm happy to pass. It looks like we all are, uh, BJ, but I'll let you kind of just break it down if if you want, if you are a listener and trying to find some way to sweat uh, through this 12 p.m. kickoff. Yeah, so this is a rematch. These two faced in qualifying twice. Denmark beat them at home and they drew 1-1 in Slovenia. But um, by expected goals, um, Denmark kind of dominated them. Um, it really, you know, uh, Slovenia wasn't even to create, be able to create over one expected goal in either of the matchups. They were basically, you know, Michael, if you're, if you're somebody who loves watching, you know, Roy Hodgson ball, then the Slovenia team is for you because it's like the most basic four, four, two low block. Let's just play in transition. Let's send long balls up there. Let's rely on set pieces type of team uh, in this entire tournament. And, you know, sometimes that can work and they have a great striker in Sesco. Um, but the Den- Denmark did a really good job in both meetings at overloading the last line of defense. They were coming out in a 3-1-6 buildup. They were constantly pulling Slovenia out of position, um, beating them with crosses and everything like that. But, I mean, the Denmark Denmark is sitting around minus 140 right now, which I think is generally just a little too high for um, this Danish team that, you know, similar to other teams in this tournament, it's kind of just the same roster except this roster – uh, is getting older and a lot of their best players aren't really playing at the top level anymore. So um, yeah, I'm going to pass on this one. But yeah, it, it really does not look uh, very interesting to me. Anything from you here, Sam, before we move on to a huge one on Sunday night? Nothing at all. I had a good look across all the markets. Don't like Denmark at that price. The goal line is, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd ignore that too. So yeah, just, just a pass. For me. Perfect. All right. Uh, 3 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, 8 p.m. Eastern and Sunday. Look at that. They gave you guys a prime time kickoff for the tournament opener. Serbia and England. Serbia, big underdog. And we all know England always takes care of, takes care of business in, in these kind of situations where they're a big favorite. They're minus 223. Uh, the draw is plus 375. Sam, we'll turn it over to you immediately um, because as we kind of alluded to earlier in the podcast, there was a friendly played. It was England's bogey team, so I think you could give them an excuse. When whenever Iceland and England meet, you don't you don't want to get too hard involved. Those those uh those those Icelandic guys give you guys tons of problems. So I'm gonna draw a line through it. But uh, I know that the country was e- eating itself alive after that one. Yeah, Michael. The, the thing is, like, I'm not too bothered about the result, but I actually didn't watch the game. I was at a wedding, thankfully. Um, but I think they had one shot on target in the 90 minutes, which. Um, well, I think we were, I think we were trailing for well, seventy-five minutes or so. So, um, that's, that's unforgivable, really, in, in a game before a major tournament. I know it's a friendly, but you want to see a little bit more. Um, so that's a little off-putting. I, I don't expect, I expect to, you know, a, an uptick in performance, of course, in the opening game. However, in this betting game, we're governed by the prices, of course, and at that, at that, um, at that England price, I'll. 
I would sidestep that. I'm not interested in it. And to overcome a, a minus 1.25 Asian handicap in the opening the game of the tournament, I, I, I don't know about that either. And I'm not sure in the goes market. I don't know if we're going to see a hat full of goes. So I don't know. I don't know what we're going to get from Serbia. They're probably one of the trickiest teams to predict what we're going to get from them this tournament, as are England, maybe. So I'm giving you a lot of I don't knows and avoids. And so that really, maybe, maybe, maybe I should just pass. So I'll put pass down on our, our little sheet here. And I'm, I'm just not confident at the prices. I'll, I'll probably, I wouldn't be surprised if England run out winners and also big winners and I also wouldn't be surprised if it was 1-0 England or 1-0 Serbia so just yeah just let's just move on to BJ just forget about me no idea yeah it's uh it's it's very difficult to predict like you said Sam what this Serbia team is going to do because that's why we love them they're they're a, they're a big ball of chaos um you could see them come out here and be like we're gonna press England we're gonna force the issue and we're going to try to turn them over, and we're just going to create this match to make it back and forth. Or you can see kind of like what they did against Brazil at the Open of the World Cup, where they're just like, let's just sit back, let's try to defend, and let's just try to see this one out. So I don't really know what's going to happen. I was potentially looking at playing England over one and a half goals just because of, you know, the, the thing with Serbia is that they can get opened up so easily uh, in transition. Their counterpressing really isn't that great. Um, but again, I don't know if we're even going to try and do that against England. Um, so we'll see what happens. Um, I'm wearing my England Jersey for Sam here and Sam, you don't know this, but people have listened to this podcast long enough. I've been waving the red and white flag, trying to tell everybody that England's the best team in the world, uh, for three years now. Um, so I'm, I'm rooting for you guys. I truly am. I, I really want to see England because they're finally pricing them. I believe as they should be as the favorites to win this tournament. So, um, yeah. I think this thing can snowball on, on Serbia. So if you're somebody like, I really want to play something in this match, I'm chasing England minus two and a half or something like that. Because, you know, you saw at the 2022 World Cup, England drew Iran in the first match. Once the first goal went in, Iran couldn't just sit back. They had to press. They had to force the issue. And England just ran over them. And that can definitely happen here against Serbia. So if you want to chase something, chase a big price on England, uh, I think is your is your best bet. I'm going to go the other way. I, I like Serbia here. I talked about them in the futures episode at 80 to one as, as a potential team that would at least outrun their odds and, or give you a chance to outrun their odds. And it's like BJ said, this team and Sam too, like completely unpredictable. Look at their results from uh, the world cup in Qatar, right? Really strong effort against Brazil in a two nothing loss. That was the game that it took the Richarlison, uh, that, that crazy goal from Richarlison to, to get Brazil the lead and, um, they were able to see off Serbia from there, a three, three draw against Cameroon. It would one of the craziest games of the tournament. And then uh, a three, two loss to Switzerland in a, in a back and forth basketball style match uh, against a team that at least the, in a rivalry that has plenty of geopolitical um, tensions. So just an, uh, in for a team that only played three games and got eliminated in the group stage of the world cup, Serbia still gave everybody their, their money's worth. And, for my money was one of the teams of the tournament just from an entertainment standpoint. And I don't think that that'll change. I think that this team is going to show up and if you're going to bet on them or you're going to bet against them and you're going to be a completely different person than you were at the end of that bet than when you were at the start, because they will take you places. This team will take you places. And I think that's exactly what England don't want to run into in a first group stage match in a tournament where they have heaps and heaps of pressure on their shoulders as the favorite. I think if you, could have drew a, a team that would sit back and play a low block and England could kind of poke and prod and get that goal like Iran, right? That uh the that Iranian team that's famously just was going to sit back under uh Carlos Kiros and play that that deep low block. I think England would have much rather play against a team like that where they can at least know what to expect from the other side. But this Serbia team, who knows? One thing you do know is that they're going to be physical. They're going to try to bully you with their size and they're going to tr try to throw tons and tons of balls into the box. Uh, for their strikers. So I think Serbia is worth a shot here at, at five and a half to one plus five fifty. Um and we'll talk a little bit more about them later. But you know Sam for, for your sake, of course, uh Serbia win, England still progress. That's that's what I'm rooting for here because we want to keep you keep you uh as happy as can be for as long as we can uh, on this podcast. That's Sunday uh wrapped up. Let's move to Monday and we'll talk about 
Romania. If you've listened to the Futures episode, this is a team that uh, I'm going to look pretty foolish on, but I'm, I'm I love them. I'm going to keep back at them. They're plus 275 uh, against the Ukraine. Ukraine is even money favorite on the three-way line, and the draw is plus 250. Uh, I'm, I guess I'm I'm obligated to, to bet Romania after what I was talking about. And I do think, like, the Sam, you think the gap's wide here. I think in a tournament setting in 90 minutes, that really shrinks uh, the, the kind of true talent disparity, especially with, if one team just wants to show up and, and make things as difficult as possible, which I do expect Romania uh, to do here and try to just uh, get anything they can from this match and, and keep keep their hopes alive as, as best they can um, after match day one. So I think Romania, I think a 0-0 result here is also uh, in the cards. I think that a bet uh, on, at, at a decent price on, on the game 10 scoreless is fine, but um, I, I want to say I love the prices. I'd rather just go down with Romania, the Romanian ship in, in the futures market, Sam. But uh, you got anything for us here? Yeah, I don't have a bet for you. Um, and it's probably not something that I should say on a betting podcast for the opening round of fixtures at a major tournament. But um, if if I have any advice for people, is if you're not too sure about a matchup, if you're not too sure about a nation or two, then just don't take a bet. So yep. for, for the second and third round games, it's um it's much easier to see where teams are out, where teams are at, how teams are going to approach things. Um, let's say a team gets three points in the first game and they can, you know, they can maybe short set up to to, to short their defense or something in, in the next couple of games. It's much easier to predict and much easier from a, a betting standpoint. So if you've got something like Romania versus Ukraine where at even money. Ukraine interested me a little bit, but they're probably priced about right. Um, I'm not sure how Romania um, are going to are gonna enter the tournament. I don't know how they're going to approach this first game. And it's just it's just difficult for me to, to pick something out. So I'm happy to pass. I'm happy to watch the game, see how both sides set up and, and see what we can do in, in uh, match day two. Yeah, see, here's the thing about Ukraine that I, I forgot to mention on the, on the Futures episode. Um, they obviously have a lot of great talent on their team, right? Their front three, I think you can make the argument for the teams that are 50 to one or longer is about as good uh, as any of those teams. Um, during Euro qualifiers, they actually had a negative expected goal differential. They didn't create over one expected goal against Bosnia or Iceland in the playoffs. Uh, against Italy and England, failed to create over one expected goal against them too. Again, they have a lot of talent and there's no problem with betting on with betting on talent, right? But like Sam said, at even money, given what we've, you know, for this Romania team, even though I'm not a big fan of them, even money for a team that did not put up great metrics during qualifying is generally a little concerning for anybody out there who wants to uh back Ukraine. Now the talent might outweigh itself and they might, you know, be really, really good and, and find a way through. But when you have bad underlying numbers, that's always a red flag trying to bet a team as a favorite. So it's a pass for me as well. And I think Sam is definitely right that at these international tournaments, especially after we get through these first round of matches, there's going to be a lot of overreaction to, to what happens in certain matches. So generally betting against that type of over, overreaction because, you know, some teams might win and they, you know, um, lose the expected goals battle pretty badly or whatever it might be. But betting against overreactions generally is pretty good at these international tournaments. So, again, if you don't like something, like Sam said, just sit it out, watch the team, get a good feel for them, and then come back for the second and third round matches. That's the 9 a.m. kickoff. So we move to noon on Monday, 5 p.m. in British summertime. Uh, it's Belgium and Slovakia. This is also Group E along with Romania and uh, the Ukraine. As you can imagine, Belgium is a – a prohibitive favorite here on the three-way line, minus 225. Slovakia, 6-1, to one, uh, if you fancy them for a win. And the draw is plus 350. I got nothing here, BJ. You're passing as well, Sam, though. You do think there is one bet uh, to keep an eye out for. Yeah, just following on from what BJ was saying about Ukraine at evens, Belgium at, um, at, at the price there are. Uh, minus 222. On an opening game of a major tournament, um, I'm just I'm I'm not sold on that. I'd rather stay away from that. However, when the market's alive, obviously there's been a lot of talk about Romelu Lukaku and his his domestic futures up in up in the air in the summer. He's got a lot to play for, and I think he's going to get a lot of chances. 
So if he opens at anything around even money, then I'd, I'd probably rather take maybe a player props angle on him to find the net over a Belgian win or over any kind of parlay. That's probably how I'd look. But in terms of the markets available now, it's it's a pass from me. Uh, that brings us to the 3 p.m. kickoff, 8 p.m. Uh, over in England. It's a doozy. This is a great matchup, I think. it's. I think this has potential to be the tie of the round. Austria is 5-1 to one, uh, on the three-way line against France, who are minus 200, and the draw here is plus 350. I, you're talking about Belgium at being you know minus 225 and that price being a little off-putting. I think France against a dangerous Austrian side at minus 200 is there as well. We all like this that this French team. We all know that they're very good um, and should be one of the teams still making noise as we get deeper into the tournament. But that's still considering uh, that still doesn't mean they're just going to walk over this Austrian team. Then you add in the volatility of it being the opening match of uh, a major tournament. I think that this the more and more I think about it, the more and more I think this could be a French, uh, the French could be on upset alert against these Austrians, BJ. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to see. I think that I wouldn't be shocked if this line moves a little bit more towards France as we get closer and mm -hmm. the money piles in. But um, I think I'll end up being on the Austrian money line uh, and you're going to come with me in one way or another. Yeah, I like Austria on the Asian spread plus one. You can get that around plus 110. So I think there's, from watching France all these years, I think there's two different ways that they are potentially beatable. You can go the England Argentina route at the world cup, try to control the match, try to pin them inside the final third and do it that way, which, you know, I think England had success against France. No, they lost, but you know, they, they generally, I think outplayed France in that match. And then the same thing with Argentina, they were dominating that match the first 70 minutes. And then what tends to happen with this French team, because they have so much firepower is they can just blitz you in an instant. And then suddenly it's two, two and three, three. Um, but the other route, which I don't think uh, a team has really been set up to do against France because France is a unique team where they, they want to get in transition. Like they want to send Mbappe and Debele and release them and, and try to get balls in over the top and utilize them in their, in their best possible way. Um, for a team to actually play a mid block and to press France and to force those long balls up to a Dembele and Mbappe. Because not only is Austria, like we said in the preview pod, they're one of the best uh, mid-block teams in this entire tournament, number one in dual win rate, but they also allowed the third lowest long ball completion rate. So if they're going to press out of that mid-block, I don't think they're going to press like crazy. Ragnick's a really good coach, so he's probably going to have them sitting back a little bit, but he's going to want them to force those long balls up there. And Austria is very well capable of winning those second balls and winning those duels in the middle of the pitch and causing France a lot of problems. On the flip side of it, so when Austria is hopefully able to create those transition opportunities, they like to get the ball out wide and they like to swing in crosses. France allowed the highest cross completion rate of anybody in qualifying. And if you know the group they were in, it really wasn't that difficult of a group. I know they didn't face many crosses, but allowing a very high percentage of them to get into the penalty area is a little concerning. And Austria has a couple of great aerial winners in the middle. France also had the second lowest defensive dual win rate, not really good at winning the ball inside their own final third. So I think Austria from a physicality standpoint can win a lot of those balls in the middle of the pitch, win a lot of 50, 50 balls and give themselves a better opportunity of winning this match. Now, as is the case of, of betting against France or, you know, is that there's this certain guy that can wreck the game at any moment, right? That's the, and that usually tends to lead them to be a little overvalued, which I truly believe they are in this first match. So I only have France projected at minus 151 or around 60%. Um, where, like you said, Michael, they're going to to minus 225. So I like Austria plus one. Uh, at plus 110. I generally think that they are set up to give France a lot of problems in this first match, similarly to how Switzerland gave France problems in the round of 16, the last Euros. Anything from you here, Sam? Nothing in terms of a bet. I'm mindful I'm not putting any bets up past, I think it was Sunday. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I completely agree. This feels, to me, like this could be trouble for France opening um, opening game at a major tournament. Um, at 
was it minus 200 for a France win? I'd, I'd be staying away from that. And I'm not brave enough to to back Austria at five to one against France and, and who they're going to turn, turn up with, like BJ said. Um, yeah, just it's, it's a pass for me, I think. Fair enough. Uh, that brings us to our last two matches. Uh, 12 p.m. Eastern time kickoff on Tuesday. Turkey and Georgia. Uh, Georgia is, I think, going to be a darling just in terms of um, rooting interest. I'm not saying that people will be looking to bet them, but uh, it's, it's good to have them in an international major international tournament. And they do, you have to say, at least get a round or group stage round one matchup against a, a beatable opponent, not not a... Uh, one of the, the tournament favorites, Turkey, who could, I guess you could call him a post-hype sleeper a bit. Uh, they I got caught up in the, the dark horse hype around this team for Euro 2020 uh, that was played in 2021. I looked like an idiot on it. It was right as this podcast started. So luckily, uh, no, we we were able to recover from that as a as a podcast. And you got you we were able to, to drag me out and keep it going and successful. But they are minus 134. For the uh, Turks are against Georgia plus 375 for them and the draw here is plus 260. I don't have anything here BJ you you are looking at, at Turkey. I would say that the price looks pretty appealing there because this, this Georgia team could end up being uh, just way way out of their depths and even a team like Turkey could provide uh, a step too far for them. Yeah I think this is uh, a little too low on on Turkey here. So as far as Georgia is concerned um, you know, they got here via the playoff by beating Luxembourg and, and Greece. But they were generally pretty bad in qualifying. If you remember, they finished fourth in their group behind Spain, Scotland, and Norway. They only won two matches and were conceding over two expected goals per 90 minutes. So even though they play a very compact 5-3-2 defensive block, there is no talent across their back line. They have a good goalkeeper. But outside of that, I mean, you can be a good goalkeeper, but if you're constantly facing just a barrage of shots because your defense sucks, it can turn you into a pretty bad goalkeeper. Um, as far as Turkey is concerned, they made a switch halfway through qualifying. Montella, who's been managing all throughout Italy and managed a couple teams, in, uh, or at least one team in Turkey. The performances got really better. They beat Croatia at Croatia. In his three qualifying matches in charge, they created five... They created a little over five expected goals. They beat Germany in a friendly 3-2. Uh, I love his in-possession system. It's very fluid. It's generally looking for quick passes, trying to get transition moments going forward, um, which can be very good when you're playing a very you know passive low block. Greece, or excuse me, Georgia is the most passive team in this entire tournament, had the highest pass per defensive action by a pretty wide margin. Um, and Turkey, although they don't have an established striker, they're kind of going from this age of like, you know, the guys we knew from Turkey from a long time. And now the young stars who are 18, 19, 20 years old are making the national team and are going to start to announce them guys like Arda Hüller, who plays for Real Madrid, Yildiz who plays for Juventus is an outstanding left winger who can beat guys in one V one situations, create his own shot, create cutbacks. So he's going to be a big problem for George's defense. And then they obviously have, um, great midfielders as well, good ball progressors in there. So, um, I mean, I projected Turkey at minus 196, uh, which I, you know, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm a little high on this comparatively to the market. But I think the market is giving Georgia just a little bit too much credit. Um, Kavar Skelia is obviously a, an amazing attacker, but he's a, he's a much better attacker for a team like Napoli that has players everywhere littered where he can actually be in 1v1s. Now he's going to be playing as one of the two strikers and he's generally just going to be having to deal with long balls over the top, which I'm not sure that um, he's that's optimal for, for his skill set. So um, I think Turkey's just uh, far too low. I think this is a really short price on a really good team. So uh, I like them at minus 125. Uh, any, anything to add here, Sam, before we wrap up the first round of the group stage? Nothing for me. Okay, that brings us to the Tuesday 3 p.m. Eastern time kickoff between Portugal and the Czech Republic or Czechia. Uh, Portugal minus 200, the Czech Republic plus 550 of the draw here is plus 320. BJ, I'm with you 100% here. I mm -hmm. think that this price, like there's a lot, there. you can make a really good argument that Portugal is one of the two or three most talented teams in this tournament and they have one of perhaps the highest ceiling in this tournament. 
they could just run rampant. But the other side of the equation here is that you could see this going in the exact opposite direction, especially because of of who their manager is. Um, so I think the checks look a really good price to pull the upset here, better than five to one plus five fifty. Um, go into it. Yeah, I I love the checks here because the thing with and I, I mentioned this during the preview pod, but Portugal, if you look at them, you know, on paper, they're the best team ever during qualifying, right? Thirty eight goals for two against. Um, but they were largely untested and faced a lot of teams that applied no ball pressure. So if you're not gonna, if you're not going to apply ball pressure to all of these amazing you know passers and ball progressors that they have, like yeah, of course they're going to rip you apart. And, and how Trent often do we see that with Belgium too? Like with Belgium exactly. those tournaments, like I know like, oh, they just go crazy in the groups, the, uh, the exactly the qualifying groups. Exactly. Yeah. The Czech Republic, I would say, is probably the most aggressive out of possession team in this entire tournament. They led Euro qualifiers in high recoveries. They were second in forward pass completion rate allowed. They're going to man mark. They're going to press. They're going to use their physicality, and they're going to cost Portugal a lot of problems because I think Portugal has a dilemma, or Roberto Martinez has a dilemma of what he's actually going to choose in terms of his midfield because they they have Jao Polina, who is probably, for my money, one of the best ball stoppers in the Premier League, but he's not press resistant, and he's not great in buildup. They have Vitinha who is a great deep lying playmaker, somebody who's can control the ball in the back line and help you through buildup. Or they also have this, you know, young kid, Jao Neves from Benfica. He's also a great ball progressor, a great deep lying playmaker. But again, Bettina and Neves aren't great ball winners. They aren't great at ball stopping. So you have a dilemma here of who do you play in the midfield? If you play Paulinha and you face a team like the Czech public, that's going to press you like relentlessly, you're going to leave yourself vulnerable to turnovers. If you play Vitinha and Neves, well, then you lose ball stopping for a team that's going to play in transition. So I think Roberto Martinez is kind of stuck here of what he decides to choose because again, they didn't play anybody that pressed them. So it never really was an issue during qualifying the Czech Republic. Not only do they press a lot, they send in a lot of crosses and they are a really good set piece team. Portugal allowed the fifth most shots per set piece in qualifying. The Czech Republic averaged 1.9 expected goals per 90 minutes. They're very good in transition. Like I said, very good at crosses. And they did all of that without their star tracker, Patrick Schick, who did not play a single minute. So I think this match sets up really, really well for the Czech Republic. I think they're an incredibly live underdog here against the Portugal team. You mentioned Sam also just lost a friendly to Croatia. Who's another very good defensive team that can apply a lot of ball pressure. So We'll see what this Portugal team looks like. Um, Ronaldo is not in the form that he once was, you know, playing in the Saudi Pro League, even through qualifying. You know, he was getting the most shots per 90 and still tended to struggle. Um, so I don't think Portugal is ready for this, quite frankly. I don't think they're ready for a team that's going to apply the ball pressure that Czech Republic is going to. So um, I love the Czechs uh, on the Asian line, plus one, minus one, two. I only projected Portugal at minus 132, around, you know, 56% or so so um love 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 the checks here sam for me it's a boring one again but this fits into the same mold as france to beat austria belgium to beat slovakia england to beat serbia all around the same price minus 200 and there's no chance i'm taking that for, for portugal here like everything that you guys have said makes czech republic a, a pre sticky opponent for Portugal and at the prices it's it's one odd swerve and also again Czech Republic at that price is one I'm, I'm just not brave enough to take to be honest with what we have in this Portugal team because we know if they all turn up and it all clicks at this tournament then they can go very very far especially with the likely draw that they've got in front of them so Portugal could click but at the prices I'm, I'm just not willing to take that risk okay uh, that wraps up the match by match segment. We'll go on to our final two portions of the show. Uh, this is the first up will be our underdog parlay where each one of us will give out a pick that is at least uh, two to one or longer. So plus 200 or longer if you're new to the show. What we do is we will give out these three legs. You can play them however you want. Uh, we, we usually just tend to sprinkle a little bit of money on the three leg parlay. We've hit one uh, in our three years as a podcast. It, was, <laughs> it, it came out as 200 and one to one or 210 to one that uh, was when brentford sam beat uh man city and uh, i think it was city losing nottingham forest then beat crystal palace 
And was it Gladbach? The it was first Gladbach like, beat Dortmund. Yeah, Glad- I will say for everybody out there, maybe new listeners, we did. Um, this is a very painful segment for us. I think we hit two of three, what, eight or nine times last year. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of them, we had a three goal lead with like 15 minutes left to play. And they, I think it was uh, uh, Frozen Nun. Yeah. It's against, an Italian uh, this year. Yeah, so, yeah. It's yeah. just, it's a, it's Sam, it's a very, pay, it's a painful segment for us and the listeners because we always just come so excruciatingly close and just never close the deal. So, um, but it's a ton of fun and, our, you know, we all love to do it. Yep. And that's why we'll continue doing it through, uh, the group stages of the Euros, at least. Uh, and BJ, uh, you can go first since we just talked about him. Uh, your checks. Yep. Czech Republic plus 550. Like I already mentioned, this is a uh, a very difficult matchup for Portugal, who was not really tested during qualifying in terms of teams that are actually going to apply a lot of ball pressure. The Czechs are one of the most aggressive out-of-possession teams in this entire tournament. Led Euro qualifying in high recovery. Second lowest forward pass completion rate. Portugal's vulnerabilities are, are generally defending crosses and on set pieces, which is where the Czech Republic, Republic thrives. So at, at plus 550, I think it's a fantastic price on the Czech Republic here. Um, I like Serbia. I'm going to take a poke and try to beat England uh, at plus 550, the tournament favorites. I think that the Serbian team is, is really, really hard to predict, and they're just as hard to handle. They're going to be physical. They're going to look to bully you. They're going to be good in the air. They've got a uh, great shot stopper. I any this team could show up and anything can happen. And at plus five fifty, I'll lean into the, the thing to happen there is that they pull an upset here uh, in a famous victory over Sam's England. Um, which brings us to you, Sam. Yeah, I don't like the sound of that, but I've gone for <laughs> Hungary at plus two three zero. And I know you gents are hot on Switzerland, so you're probably thinking, for God's sake, he's he's ruined our opening underdog pump for the tournament's kicked off, but. I just can't get away from this as as like a standout underdog pick for me, simply because I think Hungary at the price is a, is a live runner because of how even this game should be for spells. I can see a ninety minute period play out where either of these sides come out on top. So, we, so to be getting a price that fits into this underdog category is I don't know. It kind of makes it as like a bit of a no brainer for me, solely based on the difference in odds we're getting, and it's obviously not. It's not easy picking an underdog, but if you can side with a price that's value and give yourself a chance. And from what I've seen from either side in the last couple of years, this this might be worth one worth taking and, and sticking into the parlay. So fingers crossed. Yep, fingers crossed. 138 to one. Uh this one comes out to so it would get your Euro twenty twenty four adventure off to a good start, uh, if and when it gets to the window. Uh okay, on to our favorite bets for uh, the first leg of the group stage, the first 12 matches. Sam, you can go first here. I've gone with the Netherlands and under five goes parlay, minus one of five. Just really like the sound of it. I think I think the Netherlands, are like we said, they're, they're going to be solid at the back. If, if they can keep a Poland side out, one that I don't expect to be too efficient in front of goal, then I think they have enough up top. Xavi Simmons, etc., to um, Memphis Depay to to really pack a punch and, and cause Poland a few problems. So I think they just edge it, and I don't expect this to be a thriller. So, yeah, Netherlands and under five goals. I'm looking at uh, the first match of the Euros uh, between Scotland and Germany. I'm looking at it the first half to be a snoozer, to be nervy, cagey, whatever adjective you want to throw it. I like the first half to be scoreless as my favorite bet. I think anything better than plus 220 is fine here. BJ, what about you? Switzerland plus 115 against Hungary. This Switzerland team was incredibly impressive during qualifying, had a plus two expected goal differential per 90 minutes. It's a squad that's been playing together under Marat Yakin for a really, really long time. They know the system very well. They're very good at dominating the half spaces with with passing triangles, are going to be able to pull Hungary out of position. A lot of concerns with this Hungary team out of possession when they're not able to just sit in their low defensive block. They're a bad team on set pieces. They're bad defending in transition. And they're very reliant on Dominique Sobosly to be their main guy in buildup. So if Switzerland decides to take him away, I'm not sure that they're going to be able to actually be able to build through the Switzerland side. That is a very, very good defensive team and very hard to play through. So projected Switzerland at my, a little over minus 140. So I like them at plus 115. Okay. That does it uh, for the first episode of the group stage for us. We've gone through all 12 matches. Be sure to check out our futures preview. If you haven't already, we gave out 
seems like a million bets uh, on that one. And of course, we'll be back for ahead of the second legs of all the group stage. And from that point on, we will be there for the third legs. And then the round of 16, we'll have every match of Euro 2024 covered. BJ and I will talk a little Copa America uh, as we get closer to that tournament. Um, but until then, uh, best of luck with all your bets. Hope everyone has a good time listening and watching. And be sure to rate, review, and subscribe. And of course, thank you to our producer Noah on the back end and our sponsors, Bet365. 